Olá a todos, bem-vindos a mais um episódio da Prova de Contacto e hoje, como sempre, tinha aqui o meu colega Ruben. Olá, olá pessoal. Olá malta e vamos ter aqui hoje um convidado também muito especial, como sempre, uh, mas isto também é bastante especial Ui. até porque Sim. quem ouviu o nosso último episódio ouviu-nos falar dele. É verdade, não, foi, foi um dos convidados que, que tivemos a oportunidade de ver no, no Exos a ver o Fest, de, na edição deste ano, e uh, vamos já deixar um aviso que todo este episódio vai ser gravado em inglês, porque o nosso convidado uh, é belga, uh, e, e penso que está na altura para começar a, a apresentá-lo. Que, como uh, para variar, vai ser... <risos> eu... Não, vai ser tu, Ruben, vai ser tu, Ruben. <risos> ah, era hoje que eu te apanhava. É... Então, o nosso convidado de hoje é o Johan Lolos, é um fotógrafo belga-grego, lançou o seu primeiro livro, Pics of Europe, em 2018, conta com a história de uma, da viagem que o fotógrafo fez durante cinco meses pelas mais belas regiões alpinas da Europa. É mais conhecido pela sua fotografia de paisagem, ar livre e de viagens, especialmente de lugares como a Nova Zelândia, onde passou um ano inteiro a viajar pelo país ou por lugares como a Noruega, Canadá, Austrália, Islândia, Suíça. O seu trabalho tem sido apresentado em publicações e revistas, como a National Geographic, GQ, Lonely Planet. Lolos é um fotógrafo belga mais seguido no Instagram e é um dos embaixadores 4x4 da Toyota. So, we'd we like to welcome uh, Johan. Welcome Hello, to our Johan. podcast. Hello, guys. Thank you for having me. I, I hope this introduction was uh, good enough because I had to translate everything. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm pretty sure it was. It was in Portuguese. I'm pretty sure it was. I'm, I also feel like you you read my Wikipedia page, right? <laughs> a bit of the Wikipedia, a bit of your, your website, because yeah. uh, I, I read the the full bio you had on Exodus, uh, and I wanted to um, to save some of the information because I want to talk about a few things. So I uh, just want let's do the, a quick intro so I don't screw it up. <laughs> and, no, for sure, it's great. I mean, I mean, I, I, we'll definitely talk about so many things, especially because my website hasn't been updated in six or seven years now. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. So the bio on my website is so old, uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the Wikipedia page. Actually, I should check it out. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, anyway, the, the closest to the reality right now is probably the bio that you read at the Exodus Fest. Yeah. So ah, okay, okay. And and it's quite extensive. It's very very big, and, and and we're very proud to have you. So, thank you for for having your uh, for, uh, time to spend with us in this in this interview. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Very excited to be here. So, why don't we talk talk about a bit of how it all started? Uh, Absolutely. How how was your childhood? Were you were you and your parents prone to 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 travel and and and, and camp and visit places and photograph? How did it all start for you? <coughs> um, so it all started, I guess, with uh, traveling to Greece with my parents. So I was born in Belgium. My parents are Greek. So I grew up with a very Uh, Greek culture and every summer we would go and spend the holidays in Greece um, so I guess it, that's kind of how it started at least photography wise meaning like every time we would go on holidays uh, my parents have not really been too much into photography they had a, a, a film camera a very basic one and they liked to take uh, videos with an older uh, film Uh, mm -hmm. record camera but but that's all but I was always like even when I was eight or ten years old I was always the guy uh, that in the family that uh, wanted to film or to take the photos you know like they would mm -hmm. always hand the camera to me and say hey take photos of family take, <laughs> take photos of whatever so I guess I was always being very tr attracted to uh, to like yeah taking photographs And uh, and that's how it started, as I guess, because we never really went camping or anything like that. It was mm. very basic holidays, family holidays, going to the beaches, obviously uh, visiting the family since we have so much family in Greece. But that's all. Uh, and actually, my parents are not like big travelers. They keep going to Greece and sometimes to France, and that's all. And uh, they actually, I mean, for their wedding, after the wedding, they they went to Canada. But mm. that's the only time that they traveled outside of Europe in uh, in 35 years, almost 40 years. So, yeah, it's crazy. When did this this passion to to travel began? Because we we saw your presentation and, and you, you you said that you worked in in public relations, right? 
Yeah, so I studied PR. I never really worked. I never really had the time to work in PR, but I, I studied public relations. I did my internship in PR, and that was kind of my only uh, professional experience in PR. I, I wouldn't be able to really say how it started, like the, how I was attracted by the travel. Uh, so when I was a teenager, I was uh, a Boy Scout. So mm-hmm. every summer with the Scouts, we would go uh, on camp sometimes, most of the time in Belgium, obviously, but sometimes we travel to other places. Uh, so we camped in France, we camped in Scotland. Um, and, and I guess that was really how I got really attracted by the wilderness and the nature and also, I guess, the travel. Um, so if you mix everything together, like the photography, the travels, uh, the nature, uh, I got to a point where when I was in my early 20s, I was really, really passionate about reading travel stories and spending a lot of time watching uh, travel uh, photographs. Uh, tra- yeah, I mean, yeah, just watching uh, all these uh, all these photos from all these Nat Geo photographers. Right. That's how I spent most of my time when I was in my early twenties, and uh, and eventually, yeah, when I got my degree in PR, uh, I just thought, okay, I'm 25. I've never left Europe ever in my life. I guess it's time now. It's time to do a big travel, and that's how I started. So, Johan, can can you explain me how how did you overcome that that fear or that peer pressure that we usually get from from families that tell you to Go to college, uh, find a job, get a family. Uh, how, uh, that wasn't there for you? you. You you didn't have any pressures just to be home and and follow another career. I definitely had the uh, the pressure uh, coming from my parents. I didn't have the fear though. So when when I announced my parents that I was going to travel uh, for multiple years because I didn't know how long I would be away. I got obviously a lot of uh, a lot of um, yeah I guess pressure I don't know if it's pressure the the good word or if it was like a lot of uh, um, I mean I know they were just super nervous and worried about me that's the reason why they were like you should stay here and focus on your career now you just graduated uh, but uh, I, at the same time they were really excited for me to speci- specific my mom who always like loved traveling as well, but she never really was able, able to to travel as uh, as much as I do now. So she was very excited for me, but they were just like parents with a very traditional Mediterranean culture. And uh, and they, they were just, you know, for them, all, all that really matters is like, you need to succeed in life and uh, you need to at least have a, um, a really fixed kind of income. Uh, mm-hmm. That's why they pushed me so much to go and do all, all the all my studies and got a degree. So when I told them I'm, I'm going away for, for many years, they were just nervous about me not being able to make any income. I guess that was, that was the main reason. So um, I didn't have at all that pressure because for me, I was going to travel by hitchhiking anyway, and I didn't really much need the money. And I, I knew also, I had a lot of trust in me and myself because right. when I was uh, a student, I had so many parallel projects, side projects, you know, I was already a photographer, but uh, taking photos of uh, music festivals and events mm-hmm. of all kinds of sorts. I was, uh, I also had launched a couple of projects. Uh, I was the president of my student union. So I was really like, you know, I, I took a lot of initiatives when I was a student. So I never really worried. Uh, I, I was never worried about coming back from my travels after maybe two, three, five years and not being able to find a job. For me, it was always mm-hmm. sure, 100% sure that the day I would decide to come back to Belgium, I would have a job, I would find a job because uh, I, I guess, yeah, I have, um, I, I, I mean, I, I know how to, I know how to, to deal with all this kind of stuff. I, I was never worried to just, you know, be workless and, uh, and struggle with that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, for me, it was just, I need to travel and that's going to be my priority for now. So I'm going to travel first and then we'll see what happens. And what happened is just that I became a travel photographer <laughs> and I made that a, a, my job. So I guess that's the best part. Yeah. Then you went to Australia, right? Yes. So I took a one-way flight to Australia with the goal of first spending one year in Australia uh, with a working holiday visa, which will allow me also to uh, do some backpacking jobs. Uh, and after one my year in Australia, just keep keep going and keep traveling around the world. I didn't really, I really have any plans for after Australia. I knew mm-hmm. I was still going to travel after, but I wanted first to travel one year in Australia and then see what happens. 
So the the, the main the main issue during during this time is how, how did you finance yourself during during those years before the the big bang in in Instagram? Yeah. So I left to Australia. I had seven thousand euro in my bank account, and yeah. uh, those seven seven thousand euro were supposed to last for many years because, mm -hmm. uh, as I just mentioned, I was hoping to go on a hitchhiking uh, world world tour. So mm -hmm. I was uh, for me, I was going to, to travel all around the world for at least five years by hitchhiking. And from all the stories uh, of travelers who have done that before, uh, I read that, yeah, uh, five, 5,000 was the absolute minimum, 20,000, it was doable by only hitchhiking you know so i was yeah i'm going to start with seven thousand, and i'm going to do some backpacking jobs in australia but i really couldn't uh find any job in australia i was struggling with finding a job so i i spent a lot of money in, with my rent uh for the first couple of months i was in, living in melbourne and after that i just had to find a way to yeah. to make money or at least to save money because i was just spending all my money and i knew at that at that pace, I was not going to to be able to spend five years on the road. So I, yeah, I and Australia is not a cheap place, right? It's really not. Yeah, it's really expensive. And then social media came out to yes. the rescue. <laughs> ah, social media arrived. Like I guess, I guess as uh, as many many told me, and I'm fully aware of that. I was kind of at the at the right place at the right time. Instagram was literally just starting. I mean, Instagram was already a thing. Uh, Facebook has had just bought Instagram maybe two years before I went to Australia, so it was just the start, you know. Mm. Uh, and and when I arrived in Australia, uh, the word influencer didn't even exist at the time. So people, there were just people who had quit quit the job to take photos post them on Instagram and they were getting paid to do that. And that was actually the first people who were getting paid to travel and take photos and post them on Instagram. The, these people were Australians. So Australia and Canada were the two pioneers in, uh, in that industry. Hmm. And as I said, I was just at the right place at the right time because I didn't have to convince anyone in Australia that they could pay me to do whatever I wanted to do. Yeah. When I came back in Europe two years after, in 2015, it was such a struggle to convince people that I need to get paid for that. People were just like, no, we're going to pay for your travel. That's all, you know, you're not going to get paid for that. But in Australia, it was complete infrastructure. Australia was such a pioneer and visionary uh, in that industry that uh, they allowed me to get a job quite quickly. And uh, I mean, for my year in Australia, I wasn't getting paid too big money. It was uh, just allowed me to travel at no, no, no expense, kind of. So it was kind of, uh, it was just, uh, yeah, um, it was the perfect balance, if I say. And then it was just when I visited, uh, when I traveled to New Zealand after my year in Australia, I spent another year in New Zealand. That's really where I started having uh, like proper contracts. And that's early 2015 that I decided that I might, I might just try that and make a, make a living out of my photography career. So that's really how it started for me. Perhaps you can give us a, a better understanding of, of how much does the Instagram impact the, the locations that we get to photograph. What do you mean have, exactly? Maybe uh, if you go to a place that, that, that isn't very known and you get to photograph it and, and somehow it goes viral. I know you had that experience. Oh, yeah. And, and the impact that that brings in terms of tourism and how it can affect communities and it can affect the, the, the environment on the, on the place. What, what is your take on this? Should we start uh, sharing a bit more consciously regarding Instagram and social media? Absolutely. So, so it's funny because you, you, you kind of fast forward, fast forward to, to a couple of years later uh, when I, I started <laughs> right. to, to, to be conscious of that because when I was in Australia and New Zealand, I wasn't conscious at all about all that. Uh, mm. The impact that can have uh, just one Instagram post. And, uh, and so th that story uh, that uh, I've already shared is when I was in New Zealand, I lived in a place called Wanaka. And Wanaka was a, it's a beautiful place. And it was really not, not popular at the time. So I spent seven months there. And I worked a lot with the tourism board of Wanaka, helping them to, to get a bit known, more known. Uh, and, uh, the region uh, being, I would say, famous uh, on social media. 
just to attract visitors and tourists. And uh, so, so we had a few strategies, obviously, and one of them was to organize a big Insta meet that was in April 2015. Uh, and for that Insta meet, we, were, we invited really like big guys. For me, it was just starting. I mean, I, I was close to 100,000 followers. I, I didn't have 100,000 followers yet at the time, uh, but we invited big people with like almost 1 million followers. So you can imagine the impact they had yeah. uh, six years ago, almost seven years ago. And we invited all these big guys. I think in total, in total, if you if you if you totalize all the followers of everyone we invited, they were probably like two, two or three million followers altogether. And we invited them for one week to spend one week in Wanaka, mm. uh, and to help just promote the the region. So with uh, one guy that you might may know is uh, his name is Chris Burkhardt. Uh, we we I, I showed him. A super famous spot uh, mm. for that was famous within the local community. It's a it's a great hike called Royce Peak, and so we hiked to the top of Royce Peak. And uh, Chris wanted to spend the night there, so we could shoot sunset and uh, stars and sunrise. So we spent the night on top of Royce Peak, and that he, he, he took a few photos of there. And uh, and when he when he, he he shared that photo of Royce Peak, the the place just became instantly insta famous, like. A few months later, you would see so many people coming from all over the world. Because, I mean, New Zealand was already a famous place for backpackers, right? And yeah. photographers. It was already famous. But people, all the people who were already fo- like uh, traveling in New Zealand, now they would specifically go to Wanaka to do the Royce Peak hike. While before that, they would never they would never stop in Wanaka. No one would stop in Wanaka. People mm-hmm. would stop in Queenstown, but no, because it's kind of a detour to go to Wanaka. So people would never stop in Wanaka. And... Uh, and so basically, long story short, when I, when I went, went back to Wanaka a year after uh, I was living there, uh, the places just blew up. Like they, they had to install a, a much bigger parking, uh, parking lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had to put toilets on top of the mountains. I mean, it, it, was, it was completely changed um, for, for a good thing for locals in terms of economy, but also for a really bad, bad thing in terms of environment, environmental reasons. You know, people, I mean, I've always tried to be very careful when I went to the nature, to the mountains and, you know, always keep walking on the tracks, don't go out of the tracks, don't, don't put trash in the nature, don't feed the animals, all, all these things that is very natural to me and I guess it's natural to a lot of people. But the thing is, so many people are, not, are just not aware of these rules and uh, many people would just go out of the track to take photos or they would feed the wildlife or, or they would just camp where it's not allowed to camp. And, <laughs> and I really started to be conscious of that uh in 2016 2017 and uh, and yes yeah, so i changed a lot how i interact uh on instagram and how i promote places on instagram i mean i'm not i mean to like right now we're like we, it's almost 2022 and uh it's been three years i'm not really active anymore on instagram so it's not really relevant anymore but when i was conscious of that four or five years ago i really changed my way to 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 act on instagram for sure but you also kept um, a relationship with, with social media, right? Especially with Twitter. Uh, you became more active on Twitter, if I'm not Yeah, mistaken. that's very new, though. So I, I've had a, a Twitter account even before Instagram. So I think I've had my Twitter account since 2009, 2009 sorry, 2009 or 2008, I don't remember. Uh, and at the time, I was very active on Twitter when I was a student, and then... I stopped being on Twitter for almost uh, almost ten years. Um, I would just go and check the news. That's all. And now, yeah, it's been um, it's been six months, a bit more, that I'm really, really. I, I I spend most of my social media time on Twitter nowadays because there's a uh, there's just a huge community of photographers uh, being there, and uh, photographers and art collectors, and uh, obviously uh, you might have heard of the NFT. Yeah, uh, right. which is uh, boom, which are booming right now, and and to me, this is such a huge opportunity opportunity for photographers, for artists from all over the world, and from yeah. any kind of art. Uh, so I've I've spent a lot of time, invested a lot of time in building a new a new audience on Instagram and mm-hmm. uh, sorry on Twitter, and uh, and it's actually funny because uh, today is uh, December eighth, and yesterday I just had shared a, a tweet. Uh, on Twitter, 
And, you know, on Instagram, I have like more than 400,000 followers on Twitter. I don't even have 10,000 followers. And, uh, and yesterday I shared something on Twitter saying, it's crazy how big the difference of the following that I have between the two uh, platforms. And yet on Twitter, I feel so much more connected to my audience on Twitter. And I feel like anywhere I would go for my next travel, there, was, there will always be someone from the Twitter community who's going to be like keen mm. to go and grab a beer with me. Yeah. While it, it never really happened on the Instagram. I mean, I mean it, was, it used to be like this six, seven years ago, but definitely not anymore. I, I, Instagram for me is really kind of dead. It's just a platform for influencers and for, 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 a, for a lot of shit. And yeah, yeah I just we, don't, I, I just don't, I'm not comfortable at, anymore with Instagram. And, yeah, we, we've it. had this, this, this discussion regarding uh, social media and we, we've noticed that there's a, a transition with the, the photographic community and traveling community. They are changing more to Twitter and leaving Instagram behind, especially do algorithm and Instagram turning more into a, TikTok alternative and uh, what do, do you feel you get more a, a bigger and better relationship with, with your fans and with the photographic community in the traveling community in in Twitter is it it's more personal you? is it more personal uh, so right now uh, on Twitter it's mainly I mean it's I wouldn't say it's a, it's a bubble but it's almost a bubble in the way that I'm not interacting with the with the general public, if you know what I mean. We mainly all between artists and art collectors and art lovers right now, and a lot of uh, crypto investors. Uh, which means, while on Instagram, you know, I, I guess the majority, the vast majority of people who follow me on Instagram, they're not artists or they're not photographers. They're just people who actually love, like my okay, photos, and okay. that's it. But on Twitter, it's not there yet we're not there yet because it's still very very niche and it's only photographers so which also means that the the amount and the level of interaction that can be on twitter is so much better and so much higher because you interact with people who are just like you and who share the exact same passion as you right. and and there's just yeah i mean we're all on twitter for one reason right now for two reasons i guess is first because we all hate what Instagram has become yeah. <laughs> uh, because of many, many reasons, many reasons. And one of the main reasons is obviously the algorithm and all, how much frustration frustration Instagram generates right now for all of us photographers. The second reason is because this is where you need to be if you want to get into the NFT space. So the, because all the collectors are there, because all the artists, and I'm not talking about photographers only, but all the, all the artists are on Twitter. This is the place to be if you want to be seen, if you want to share your work, if you want to work, your work to be seen. You need to be on Twitter. So we're all there for the same reasons, which also means we're all pushing ourselves up together. Yeah. So it's all about being like very uh, united and uh, supporting the community. It's, It really is a community, dude. It's it's insane. When I say when I say that if tomorrow I'm going to Brazil or to India or to Philippines, I'm hundred percent confident. I just have to tweet, "Hey, who's that for B? I'm be I'm going to be in, in Bangkok tomorrow." There's going to be so many people who say, "Yeah, I'm I'm keen." While if I do that a story on Instagram saying, "Hey, who's keen to meet me for for being in Bangkok?" It's going to be like like ghost town, you know? <laughs> Although I have like 10, I don't know, like 40, 40 times more more uh, more people more following likely, me on Instagram. Right. It's, it, it's insane. It's insane. I, that's one of the reasons why I love Twitter so much and why I spend so much time on Twitter right now is because it generally feels that you are part of a community and that reminds me so much of the early years of Instagram. I, it was just like that in 2014, 2015 on Instagram. It was just like that. It was not about competition. It was just about hanging around with friends, going out in the nature, hiking with friends, and like just trying to get a better photographer. That's all. And that's exactly what it is now on Twitter. And most importantly, to finish, uh, Twitter numbers don't matter at all. You, I'm, it's insane. When I started on Instagram, I was following obviously all all the big photographers that I was always looking up to. You know. And, uh, and it was when you start on Instagram and you have just a, a couple of thousand followers, it's really hard to get noticed. And you hope that 
your, your, your mentor is going to follow you back, you know, like you like, oh, I, I would love for my mentor to follow me back and, uh, and hang around with him. That never happened on Instagram. There was such a thing about numbers. People would just like look at the numbers and say, oh, you just have 2,000 followers. I'm not going to follow you back because right. you're probably worthless. While on Twitter, there's nothing about that. There's nothing about that. It's crazy. Like people, people follow each other just because how genuine they are, how good they are for the community. And just if their photo are good, well, I don't care if you have like 200 followers or 2,000 or 20,000. I'm just going to follow you back because I love what you do. And that's, that's what is beautiful about Twitter as well. So I, I really hope it's going to stay like this and, uh, and Instagram is not going to buy Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> So you 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 started with uh, with NFTs uh, quite recently, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I've watched the NFT has been space. the experience, and, and and can you tell us how are you selling them? Do, are you selling directly or through a, a, a art gallery? How how yeah. are you managing? So it's. Uh, I mean, you could. There's a very very tiny minority of artists, and those are really big artists who can sell directly on the website, but that requires you because NFTs are based on the blockchain right. and uh, to mint, minting an NFT means basically putting uh, a piece of art on the blockchain. So it's able to be sold. You know, it's you just put it on sale basically. So when you mint an NFT, you need to put it on the blockchain and you need a smart contract for it to be on the blockchain. So either if you want it to put on your website and minting it on the blockchain, you need to find a developer who's going to write the smart contract for you. And, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit geeky. So what 99% of the artists right now are doing, they use marketplaces, which kind of are online galleries. Mm -hmm. And they're minting the pieces of art in those marketplaces because these marketplaces have their own smart contracts, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. it's like, how can I explain that uh, in an easier way? It's like, um, I don't know. It's like you want to sell, uh, you want to sell, uh, I don't know, anything. Uh, you want to sell furnitures, okay? You want to start selling your furnitures that you have at home. Uh, so you, you, you're gonna, you, you have two ways to do that. Either you sell them on eBay uh, because it's a proper platform and it's going to be easier for you to reach your, your clients and everything is already set up and you can have all the payments easy, easily. Or you can also create a website uh, where you're going to sell your own furnitures on, on the website. But that means that you have to develop the website you have to develop uh, a payment method, like accepting credit cards and stuff. And that's a bit, I mean, nowadays it's very easy to do, but, you know, it would still be a pain uh, for, for, for most of the people. So the marketplaces are just there to, to make the task easier for you and also to reach a brighter audience. But of course, the marketplace will also take a commission out of your sales. So that's, that's the, the bad thing about it. But uh, in terms of today, it's, it's really great. So you have different kind of marketplaces. You have the, the most famous one, which is accessible to anyone, which is called OpenSea. Uh, and these guys at OpenSea, they take a very, very small commission, which is just 2.5%. And then you have like a bit more curated marketplace. One is called Foundation. Foundation is curated in the way that you need to be invited by, by another artist to mm. get in Foundation. And those artists, to be able to invite you, they need to have make to have made a few sales already. So as soon as they have made sales, they have invitations they can share with their friends. Uh, so that's another marketplace, which is just, as I said, a bit more curated, but these guys take 15% commission. And then you have the high-end galleries, high-end marketplaces like Super Rare, uh, where to get there, you need to be curated by the Super Rare staff. So they need to, you, in, you need to apply and uh, you need to, to send your application. And if you accept it, then you can be on Super Rare only. That's the only way. And these guys also take 50% commission. And I was lucky enough to be accepted on Super Rare, which is like right. the best platform, the most creative <laughs> platform you can find right now. Uh, so yeah, I was very really excited when I got the news two months ago. How, how do you see this this long time, long term with, with NFTs? How do you think this is going to impact the, the, the photographic industry? Do you think people are going to be more free to photograph what they want? Or do you think they're going to be more con um, contrite regarding this is just going to be for the money? 
Absolutely not. So it's a it's a good one. <coughs> uh, so for me, the way I see NFTs, uh, it's let's just talk about photography here. Right. The way I see NFTs for photographers is just a new opportunity that will allow photographers to just focus on what they really want and love to shoot. Because the problem nowadays, and you can talk to absolutely anyone in the industry, in the photo industry, and the only kind of exceptions would probably be the big, big, big Nat Geo photographers who like have decades of, uh, of experience already. But you could also talk to a, a new Nat Geo photographer or documentary photographer, and he will tell you that... Uh, he, he doesn't really get paid much when he works for the press because all the budget are just going lower and lower and lower. And most of the documentary photographers that I know uh, nowadays, they all tell me that they have to accept corporate jobs on the side because that's what's going to pay the money, you know? Uh, that's what's going to pay the bill, sorry. So, and, and I'm just talking here about documentary photographer, but me as a landscape photographer, I mean... I used to be only landscape. Now I do a bit more. Uh, I mean, I just do all kind of travel related photography. But me as a travel photographer, I also have to accept. I wouldn't call them corporate jobs, but at least jobs that would that that would just pay a bit better than what I would just usually try to sell to my clients in the way that I love to shoot. You know what yeah, I mean? Just, just so, the balance, right? <laughs> so, but but. We all hate all those jobs. It's yeah. not like the best part of our jobs. <laughs> it's, it, 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 we, we just do these jobs because that's the only way to get paid because the reality is nowadays, it's really hard to be a, to be a full-time photographer. Uh, I don't have the exact number in mind, but in France, for example, the, the average income, monthly income for a photographer is below 2,000 euro brutto, not even mm. netto, brutto. Right. So uh, if you remove the tax, it's, it's close to maybe 1,300 or 1,400 euros net, you know, which is, which is nothing, nothing to, to make a, like a comfortable living. You just like, it's just, uh, it, it, you just earn as much as a, as a worker in a, in a factory, you know? So it's really hard to, to, to be a full-time photographer because full-time photographer is not a, it's not a nine, five, nine to five job, you know? Right. It's like, you have to work. 12, 16 hours a day. You have to do everything. You have to pitch out your projects. I mean, it's it's such a big and huge job that it requires so much time. And at the end of the day, you're not getting paid much for that. So for me, the NFT are just the best opportunity for all the photographers to find the collectors who are actually going to love what you do and pay you for what you actually love shooting, you know? And to, to me, just that, just that, was enough when people when I discovered about NFTs. Just that was in, was enough to me to give it a try. So okay, if I can invest a bit of my time on Twitter and try to see if I can make it um, through NFTs, hmm. well, it's gonna be definitely worth it because I see that on the long run. You know, I'm just not here for the next three months or next year, and I, I'm just gonna be here. To me, my life has just changed when I discovered about NFTs. My life, my life as a photographer changed. I, I just discovered a new a new income opportunity that mm -hmm. will allow me to focus on what I really want to do without the struggle and without the worry of right. shit. I actually need to accept other job on the side. You know, I need to make sure that that client is going to sign again for a new contract next year. Uh, all these kind of struggle that a freelancer has. I hope, I hope that I will be lucky enough to not have them anymore in the future because of NFTs and NFTs. We're talking here about NFTs. What we actually talking right now we're talking about crypto art being sold as NFTs, but NFTs are so much bigger and broad and wider than just crypto art, right? NFTs is just a certificate of ownership that is, that is written on the blockchain. And NFTs are here, and write those words, NFTs are here to stay for the decades to come. Uh, NFTs is a new technology. And the way I see that, I might be wrong, but the way I see that is... All the brands in the world, and they actually have started, Adidas uh, is one of the last to have announced that just uh, went into NFTs. But all the brands of all around the world are going to jump into NFTs. And all the general public in the 5 to 10, 10 years max is going to own a few NFTs. And I, mm -hmm. think, I think that in 10 years, you're not going to buy a house uh, 
and go to the notary to get your certificate of ownership of your new house. You're just going to get the NFT of your house that you just bought. You know, that's how I see it. Because today, the only, you know, I, I bought a house three years ago. The only proof that I am the owner of my house is just a paper that says that a notary have signed and I have signed. <laughs> and that's the only proof that exists, right. you know. <laughs> so if, if tomorrow, if tomorrow, I don't know, there is a coup happening in Belgium and the government shut down and uh, there is a war in Belgium and all these official papers just are being destroyed and burnt. There's no more proof that I'm the owner of my house. But the NFTs and the blockchain is always going to be written in the blockchain forever. And this is going to be 100% transparent for anyone. So for me, we're just talking about something that is going to change the world and that we're going to stay here for the long run. So just to answer your questions, I'm not here just for the quick cash grab. I'm here. I see that like for the decades to come. And I've actually started to buy NFTs as well because for me, I, you know, I, I see that, yeah, I'm just going to buy NFT and see, okay, what I invested in NFTs, we'll see what it's worth like in five to 10 years. I, I see that, but you know, I, I don't want to share any financial advice. It's just my my way to, to think and what, my way to see that. But I really believe that NFTs, are just going to change the world and uh, maybe not for the best, but they're going to change the world just as internet had changed the world 20 years ago, you know? Yeah, so, and we're still not seeing what, what the future upholds regarding the, the metaverse because we had news this week or last week, something about the land being sold on the metaverse and yes. virtual galleries being created with NFTs. And it's it's going to be crazy when when this oh, is growing even more it's going to be huge and and the 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 nft system is going to allow for artists to be more independent and more more free more don't have to start thinking all the time i need to sell this cuz I, I need to pay my rent i need to pay my my bills people with more freedom get to be more creative more spontaneous and and more happy because we're talking about if we can all be happy, wouldn't that be better, <laughs> right? So, so much. I fully agree with you. And, uh, you know, I, I read it when I started to watch the NFT space, it was early 21, uh, 2021, yeah. And uh, there was one guy, <coughs> I love his tweet, his tweet. He tweeted something like that. He said, uh, wait, let me just find the tweet because it was so good <laughs> that I want to share it here. Uh, it was, uh, it was, Okay, artist, lawyer, uh, super. I think he tweeted. Uh, I'm gonna find that. Oh my god! Of course, trying to find a tweet that happened uh, ten months ago. Okay, I, I cannot find. But anyway, the the idea was uh, that we all grew up. All of a generation, we all grew up with the idea that to to being successful, you needed to become a lawyer or a doctor or right. Any sort of, like, you know, we all grew up with that idea because that's what our parents have taught us since we were born, right? Like, you need to be a doctor, you need to study, you need to be a lawyer, blah, blah, blah. He tweeted that. He said, we all grew up with that idea, but the next generation will grow up with the idea that to make it and to be successful, you need to be an artist. And I love that idea so much because it's so not true right now. You know, all the artists... I mean, not all, but the vast majority of the artists all over the world have been struggling, financially speaking. All the artists, when, when you know, like, just imagine you are in a big meeting with a lot of big people and everyone say, yeah, I'm a lawyer, I'm a CEO, I'm blah, blah, blah. And then you just say, I'm an artist. You almost feel shy and ashamed yeah. of you. <laughs> like, oh, fuck, what are they going to think about me? I'm just a freaking artist, right? But this is going to change in the next 10 years. This might change. And, and the people who actually, people will be jealous of artists. Uh, people, of, yeah, people will start being jealous of artists because artists will have the life that everyone wants. Everyone wants. Everyone will want to be an artist, which means it's going to be the fact that an artist in 10 years is just going to be someone who just creates what he loves to do and is getting paid for that. That's going to be the definition of an artist. And right now, an artist is just creating what he loves to do, but he's struggling to get paid for what he does, right? <laughs> but I think that in 10 years, that might change. I really hope that might change. Yeah, so, fing fingers but, crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed, yeah. Fingers crossed. We'll see. Well, I, I think that everyone that's listening already knows that NFTs is a great 
passion passion of you right now and perhaps as you said uh, it might be the future in art and perhaps you will change uh, something even related with galleries and uh, do you think that galleries will have to pay more attention to what's happening in the nft world and try well, to to to, yeah. to to find the 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 new yes, and it's, hot artists it's going to be a competition between the the, yeah. the nft galleries and and the physical galleries cuz I, I don't see people buying prints anymore and respecting the the, the true work behind a photograph and, and what took a, a photo, the journey that took, a photographer took just to get that picture. People don't really get the value, but I, I'm seeing more in the NFT world that respect is there. For sure. And, uh, and it's worth mentioning also that right now the collectors, the NFT collectors and the crypto art collectors uh i would say that 99% of them they're not collectors in the traditional art world or art mm. world sorry okay. so they have no clue how the i mean of course we all kind of know how it works in the traditional world but they, they they're not coming from there so they're just genuinely impressed by what they see and they're not judging any artist by how the clout that he has like the influence that he has in the art world, right? He just sees something that he likes, something that really connects with him or connects with her because there's also female uh, collectors, obviously. Uh, so they just see something that really connects with them and they just, just just don't think twice, you know? They might think twice, financially speaking, like, is it going to be a good investment or not? But most of them, if they connect with it and if the price sounds right, they're just going to go for it because they just love it. And that never really happens in the traditional world, you know. In the traditional world, as you said, it's just all about the fame, the influence, yeah. uh, if you are part of a good gallery or not, if you have the right connections, the right relationships, and this is so fucked up. I mean, it's all about being elitist, and I hate right. that so much about the traditional art, and I feel like this whole elitist world is just collapsing through the NFTs, and I really hope, I really hope that some of the major players from the trad world will come also to the NFT world and they will just they will just see like this is so like everything start from scratch, you know. Like you want to make it as an NFT artist. Well we don't really care if you made it as a big artist in the traditional world because you you kind of of course not you will have a big a bigger value than the one who's coming just from Instagram. But still He's just going to speak to a new audience, to a new audience of collectors who don't really know him from before. And and he's just going to prove himself that uh, he's, he's just worth it. I mean, everything comes back from scratch. And that's another thing I really like about this space. And in the Twitter also, like, you have all these big influencers and Instagrammers coming from Instagram, like bragging about the fact that they have like millions of followers on Instagram and they come to Twitter and they try, they try to sell NFTs and it just doesn't work because they say, oh, wait, why isn't it working here? Well, <laughs> just guess what? You, you just scratch, start from scratch again. You're just nobody here. So we don't care if you have like a million followers on Instagram. You have to get involved with the community. You have to show your support. You have to be supportive and you have to, to really make everyone understand that you're not here just for the money, but that you're also here because you believe in the technology and that you believe it's going to stay forever for the next decades to come. And that's going to actually be life-changing thing for photographers. So, oh yeah, I'm passionate about that. And I actually love the fact that this podcast <laughs> is shifting to NFT discussion right now. I didn't expect that. This is just like a, a, a conversation between three friends and a coffee shop. So this yeah, can go yeah, anyway. Right. <laughs> and I'm and, and the reality talking is, about I, it. Oh, oh my God. The reality is I tell, I talk about NFTs to all my friends right now. <laughs> so they're probably, they're probably so sick of me. But uh, every time I'm going for a beer or a coffee with a friend, I always end up talking about NFT because that's also another mission of everyone in the community kind of is like we want to we want to endorse everyone we want to bring everyone in the NFT space because yeah. again there's no it's not it's not about competition there's there's no competition here the more people are going to join the NFT space and the more people are going to start selling NFT and the more people are going to sell NFTs and make wins the more everyone will benefit from that, you know? Because as I said, we're just so early and this is just the beginning. 
So we need to show everyone in the world that NFTs, are, we, we all be very serious about that. And this is just the beginning of it. So, oh yeah, I'm excited about it. I'm excited <laughs> about the future, honestly. Yeah, I, I'm kind of nervous as well. I have a, a photograph of mine that's probably gonna, next week, gonna be on converted to NFT and being put for sale. So I'm kind of nervous what's what's going to happen with it. <laughs> so <laughs> you you're going to mint it on a on a marketplace you said? I I am working with a with a company that belongs of a, a cousin of mine and they're going to be handling everything for me. I just have to handle them the 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 image and they Oh my do god, that's great. The commission is a, a bit higher than than the one you have, but considering all the work that goes behind, I I really don't mind. <laughs> Of course, yeah. Oh man, that's exciting! Happy for you. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna have to let me know when it's gonna live. Yeah, and I, I, I'm I'm hoping this gives me a bit more freedom and allow me to pursue my projects more the way that I want them. And and especially for me and for for everyone, the everyone that believes in 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 the work that we do and the impact that we can give to to the world and the people around us, having this the this capital freedom. Can we call them that? It, it, it can be quite an improvement for for everyone, and this is why I'm I am also excited as as you. So I'm I'm hopeful this this is going to be good from now on. <laughs> well, that's really all all the best that I can wish for you. It's a as you said, like that financial freedom. That's really what every artist should have, yeah. and no artist in the world should be struggled to accept shitty jobs that he doesn't want to do just because that's the right. only way to get paid. That is so sad when you think of that. But that's the sad reality, unfortunately, right now. So really, really hope that the NFTs are going to change that. We'll see. So I believe tell us, tell us a bit, Ma, how has it been going so far? Um, have you gotten time to to start traveling again after after COVID? Just trying to shift a bit more going back to, to your travels Yes. Again. So COVID has been uh, really bad for the business, as you can imagine. Uh, mm -hmm. Every every, I mean, all my all my business is based on travel. I don't really shoot or have any clients in Belgium. So yeah, it just everything just shut down instantly, and um, it took about. Let me think. Uh, so COVID started in March 2020, and my first assignment after that was in uh, June 2021. So it took more than a year to really have the first assignment back. Um, and it's been very still very slow ever since. I, I can feel it's not going there yet. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I have friends who, who, go, who are getting back to work. But I mean, I've, I've, I've also declined a couple of jobs that I've, I was not too excited about it neither. Uh, but apart from that, yeah, I mean, I've traveled myself on personal projects uh, like last summer and the summer before. Uh, I went on a road trip with my girlfriend and uh, we traveled a bit around Europe as we usually do. But that's kind of it. Um, mm. So, can, yeah. Can it's, it's, with it's, with it's a new hot. book? <laughs> no, I mean, I haven't really have any book, new book in mind right now. Um, that's definitely in the plans for... For the future, I'd love to make a, a second book, which is probably going to be very, very different from the first one. Mm -hmm. um, the first one was really about me, I guess, uh, and my journey as a photographer through discovering Europe. I want the second book, if there's one, to be more about a specific project, a series that I have in mind, uh, but where I'm not the subject. I mean, I was not the subject in my book. Uh, I, I don't think there's... A single photo of me, but it's still my road trip. You know, it's a book about my road trip. Yeah, and you were always there in the pictures. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we'll see about the second book. I, I definitely is going to be a different book if I ever do, if I ever make a second one. So we'll see. I I, I know you you're also uh, Jean Paul is going to start laughing now because I am also an avid photo book collector, and I know you oh, have an wow. Instagram account regarding that. So I always, I also want to talk about photo books with you. <laughs> yeah, you, ha you, you, you also have an Instagram <laughs> account, right? The photo book right. junkie. The photo book junkie. That's who yeah. I am, yeah. <laughs> well, how, you can start talking about books. How, how big Go is ahead. your collection right now? <laughs> Dude, I have no clue. To be honest, I have no clue how big it is because I have books all over the place wow. right now. <laughs> and uh, like there's literally piles of books because I don't have enough room anymore on my shelves. 
Uh, so I, I would need to count them. I downloaded an app uh, about three weeks ago that allows me to... You, you, you just scan the, the, the barcode at the back of the book, and then you just, it just lists all the books that you have in your collection. Ah. And I started doing that, but I need to do that for all the books that I have. So at least I know which book I have, which book I don't have, and how many books I have. But I think, I think I'm pretty close to 300 books right wow. now. <laughs> probably. You can open yeah. a library. <laughs> oh, yeah, probably. I mean, a small one, it would be a tiny one, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, that's, I'm, that's great. And you, I just, yeah, I started, I started four years ago, I think, buying books, three or four years ago. Do you have so, a, a, um, a photographer there that, that is your go-to photographer that once it comes out something, you need to have it? Oh, not just one, dude. <laughs> not just one, yeah. I mean, uh, I have all books of uh, Sebastião Salgado, for sure. Right. A any book that he releases, I just buy it instantly. Uh, I think I'm pretty close to having all the books from Steve McCurry as well. Oh. Um, I have all the books from a Dutch photographer that I really love, uh, whose name is Bastian Wood. Bastian uh -huh. Wout, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. He's a photographer of my age, uh, doing shooting mainly fashion, uh, medium format fashion portrait. But I mean, his, his job, his work is completely amazing. Uh, who else am I buying every single book? Um, oh, there's a Belgian, there's a Belgian photographer that I really enjoy as well, and I have most of his books. He's called Carl uh, de Kaiser. He's a Magnum photographer. Ah, um, see. yeah, I know. Yeah, and Vincent Munier. There's another one, Vincent Munier, wildlife photographer. I, I have all, all of his books. Uh, I love that guy so much. He, his work is insane. I don't know if you go, if you know him, but he's one of the pioneer pioneer in uh, wildlife photography. He really he really changed the game when he when he arrived 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, yeah, I can't, I can't, I have so many books. It's crazy. <laughs> and I'm a big fan of magazines too. I, I buy a lot of, of, uh, photo magazines. Magazines I, and I, zines and. Oh yeah. Yeah. Zines, <laughs> magazines, uh, yeah, I mean, all over the place. And also buy a lot of these, uh, uh, contests and fair festival catalogs. So wow. I, I would have, I would have the catalog of each year of, uh, uh, the photojournalism festival Visa pour l'image or the World Press Photo. I have every year since 1993. Oh. Uh, yeah, so it, uh, or even the Wider Photographer of the Year. I have the the portfolio, the catalog of the last 20 years, I think. So that is really great because it allows me to go through each year and see the evolution of the and the trends of each year for the yeah, last 20, 30 yeah. years. You know. So that's so interesting to to to, to go through. You just take uh, any year, like you take a, uh, uh, I don't know, two thousand two, and you just say, oh, okay, this this was how wildlife photography or photojournalism was twenty years ago, and you go through all the trends. And I love doing that. So every catalogs of all those big contests and festival, I buy them as well, yeah, and I try and, and, and I try to to story. find them second hand. Yeah, and it's it's kind of a short story of what happened in that year, right? Of so course, as well. Yeah, specifically back. for the. Specifically for the world press photo, that is, uh, it just tells the story of the world, the whole world. And uh, I've managed to find second hand since 1994, I think. So yeah, it's great. So how do you see those competitions now that we're talking about them? How do you see and and, and what do you think they they do for for, for photography nowadays? Because I, I see photo competitions <coughs> appearing everywhere. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I, yeah, I think photography is is getting a, a bad eye regarding that issue because everyone just thinks they're a photographer right now. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about uh, about photo contests. I mean, there's there are the big ones, the institutions. You know, like you cannot really like uh, say anything wrong about Roll Press Photo. Uh, Sony, Sony Photo Award, uh, the Hasselblad Masters, you know, all these big ones uh, are really institutional and they, have, they are really part of the history of photography. Mm. So I think it's, I mean, also it's very life, it's life changing. If you, if you win one of these, your, your life as a photographer changes instantly. Your career, if you just yeah everyone wants to work with you overnight you know it, it's really so i guess i've never applied for any i've never entered to any of these contests i wish i would 
be able to find the right work to apply to enter the contest and mm. hopefully one day I would win an award. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but uh, it's still somewhere in my mind. Uh, for all the tiny photo contests, yeah, I don't bother. Some, most of them, not not all of them, but most of them, they they're not really there for, for the photographers. You know, they're just there either to make money because you have to you have to pay a certain amount of money to enter per image, and so, so that's a great way for for the organizers to make big big money. Uh, and most of the time also, it's just an easy way for people to get free images. So you really, really have to be cautious and read all the TNCs when you t enter a contest. Most of the time, or at least a lot of time, it will require you to give all your rights of the image you enter with to the organization. And to me, that's a big no. That's a big no-no. Like uh, even, even if you can win 10,000 euro as a first prize, uh, the chance that you win first is really, really small. And even if I win that, it's not worth it for me to give all my rights for photos. So I don't know. I, I, as I said, I never really enter any contest. Uh, yeah. Maybe and I should. Any competition know. that asks money for you to enter, it, it's going to be catchy. Yeah. At least that's, yeah. that's my opinion. Yeah. yeah. And, and actually the big ones I mentioned earlier, most of them are free uh, to enter. So yeah. Yeah, I, I don't like. I don't really like when you have to pay to enter a contest. And and I know some. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of photographers that I know. They have like a budget per year that goes just for entering uh, for the contest and uh, and doing a portfolio uh, reviews and these kind of sh stuff. But it's. I mean, it's great. Portfolio reviews are great. They really help you <laughs> go through your work. And you know, have, it's great to have feedback from professionals. Uh, it's great to hear that uh, your photos suck and you need to get it to, to improve your work. It's really, it's really important, I think. But um, I don't know. It's just... Uh, you, you can do it at, at so Perpignan, much that. right? It, it doesn't have yeah. to be at a, a festival and then having to pay for it. Now you can do it at Perpignan, indeed. Uh, I think you need a, a VIP pass to, 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 to do that. Yes. Though. Or uh, I'm not sure it's free, though. I'm not sure it's free. You, you probably have to pay like a couple of hundred euros no. to, to get access to those reviews. But uh, as I said, yeah, I, if I have to do one, I would probably go to Perpignan, Visa pour l'image, and do that there right. because I know uh, I'm going to talk to a proper iconograph and, um, and uh, he knows his work and he's going to give me like the best advice. Mm -hmm. But most of the things that you find online are not really worth it, I think. Tell me, the, the, you were mentioning that it, at some point you would like to get an award from one of one of these festivals or competitions. Do you have any goals that you feel that uh, haven't been fulfilled in photography or in travel? I have many glo many goals for sure. Um, oh, what, I mean, what is your top top goal? What is it that 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 travel you want to take? What is that photograph you want to pursue or that project? What what's what's in your heart burning right now? Yeah, I mean, travel wise, I don't know. There's no like a specific place I'm really dying to go and visit one day. There's so many places on my list, but there's no. I, I don't think there's a single place that I will feel so happy and relieved once I go there. So it's it's more about the story. So right now, I think what I really want to do is achieve uh creating and working on a specific photo series a photo project uh a long-term one probably i guess long term uh where i can really spend the next two three years focusing on that work uh and tell a story and then get publications in magazines such as net geo uh and then get exhibited for that work and maybe awarded and just that which would be uh You know, just that would take probably two, three, maybe five years to achieve altogether. Like from the way the, the day you start working on your series to the day you get awarded and published for that series, uh, all the lifespan of five years. This is something that I've never done as a photographer, and that's really something that I feel I need to do. But it's really hard. It's really hard for me because, um, again, we've discussed a lot about that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, I'm ready to spend five or th even three years of my life without having 
the financial security that I'm going to get paid for that. You know, so most of these person projects, you have to invest so much money in, and most of the time you're not really getting paid. So it's um, you're just losing money and and focusing three years of my life on, on a project. I, I don't know if I'm ready for that. So that's why NFTs are really important for me right now. Also, is if I can make a proper income with these NFTs, I can also focus on on working on projects that I'm going to pay and spend my money on it without the worry of, oh shit, I'm spending so much money on that and I'm not ever going to get paid for that. Well, if NFTs are, are there to help me, that's that's a great thing. So this is something, this is really a, a milestone, an achievement that I want to to make as a photographer is getting to to work from A to, from a to Z to on a proper photo series and, and getting seen, uh, published and rewarded and yeah. That that would be the dream, I think, and then you just start again because that's the life of surfer, right? You just do it again and again, and you just try to find new new topics and new new subjects to cover. Yeah, and trying to find new projects and ideas, right? Yeah, and you talk about topics, and we also know that you have a podcast, right? Yes, absolutely. So that's something that I I started uh, this year, earlier this year. I guess as part of uh, my big hiatus of not being able to travel because of COVID. So I had a lot of free time. Uh, I also had an intern working for me for four months. So you really helped me out putting that together, the YouTube channel, the, the podcast, uh, and so many other projects, online courses as well. Uh, so my goal with the podcast was to, to just uh, uh, find new, new topics to talk about in photography but also for me it was, at, at first it was a very very selfish project i just me as a photographer wanted to talk about photography with other photographers to learn more about their job and their this genre of photography you know like i've interviewed wildlife photographer i've interviewed uh fashion photographer advertising photographer all these kind of photography genres that i never really knew much about And me as a photographer, I really wanted to understand how their work works and how it is to be a wildlife photographer and what are the struggles about that and how it is to be an advising, advertising photographer and what are the, trigger, the struggles that come with that job. So that was the, the goal with that podcast. So I think I, I don't even know how many episodes. I, I haven't published any episodes <laughs> since summer, unfortunately, because uh, of the, the last, lack of time. The last time I saw, I think you had nine episodes. Okay, so I have, I've published nine. I know I have yeah. three record, re recorded already that I need to publish. Three more than I it's need called, to publish. For, for those, those who are interested, it's called Blue Hour, right? Yes, but it's in French. It's but in it's French, French yeah. Yeah, it's in French. Uh, but yeah, if any, anyone speaks French, uh, just uh, please feel free to find it uh, on any platform. Um, so yeah, I, I, I loved, honestly, I was passionate about, specifically also about having my guests I'm sure it's the same for you. You have your guests, uh, you invite them and you meet them physically. And that I love that. Having all those guests uh, coming to my place and to the studio and we were recording for the, uh, the, the, the episodes. But quite quickly, I felt like it constrained because uh, I live in Belgium. So for e it was easier for me to interview Belgian photographers and there's a lot of talents in Belgium. I also wanted to interview a lot of French photographers who I find really uh, uh, inspiring. So... It was it was hard for me to bring them to Belgium, so that's what I did in the summer. I took a, I went on a little road trip in France with all my gear, and uh, I mean I just interviewed three three or four photographers in France. That's this summer. I still have three more to publish, uh, but at least at least it was great to go and meet also French photographers and talk to them. Uh, so I was coming to their place, and uh, we had great chats. So yeah, I, I'm I'm definitely I would love to go back to. To, to doing a more podcast. I love that. It's just that I need to find the time now between NFTs and that. <laughs> you talked about inspiration. Do, do you want to share with us some uh, movies or books you've read that you're finding like a source of inspiration to your work? Um, I'm really bad at that every time I, people ask me for inspiration. <laughs> Sorry. Because, <laughs> no, it's, it's just that... Clearly I, I the, really, the photo books are one, right? Yeah, photo books. Well, that's, that's one thing, right? It's like, I really... I, re, I don't have one specific, one specific uh, project of photography or book or movie that I can, I can tell you for where I, I find my inspiration. I just find my inspiration from all over the place. And that also can be Instagram, Twitter, social media, but photo exhibitions, photo magazines, photo books, uh, paintings, 
uh, I mean, everything, even the nature, you know, even going out in the nature. I, mm. I really try to find my inspiration everywhere, and uh, but I don't have one specific one specific photographer or one specific uh, movie director that I can quote. Unfortunately, it's um, it's a bit annoying, <laughs> embarrassing, actually. No but, one can ask you, what would you take to a deserted island, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> it's going to yeah, be too much. <laughs> that's, that's a really tough one. Yeah, I really, I really cannot answer that question. I'm so, so bad at that. <laughs> no yeah, problem. stuff. So tell me, are, are you still preparing anything regarding your um, photo photo tours? Uh, well, I just came back from a photo tour that I gave in Kenya a month ago. Right. Uh, that was uh, that was a, a long due one because uh, I started to sell that photo safari workshop back in uh, the autumn of 2019, just mm -hmm. after I, I returned from two months in Africa. And the, the the workshop was supposed to happen in March 2020. Then COVID happened, and we postponed it three times. And eventually, a year and a half after I did it, it was November 2021. Uh, that was so great. Uh, first time I came back to Africa in two years. It really felt great. Uh, I haven't planned any any other one yet, but uh, I mean, I love that so much during workshops and photo tours. So I've done three so far. One in New Zealand, one in Norway, one in Kenya. Uh, I need to find out where's, the, the, where's going to be the next one. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah. yeah, That one in Kenya, you have some photos on your website, right? You want yeah, so, com? Yeah, uh, it's, it, it was just a place where I put all the information about the yeah. workshop. Uh, that's it. But I haven't shared any photos of Kenya okay. yet. Okay. Uh, But we, yeah. we invite everyone who's listening to us to, to see your website, visit it, yoanlolos.com, where they can have all the links for your social network. Right? Yeah, exactly. Well, well, Please keep in mind, though, that the, work, the website hasn't been updated in six years for the photographs that you see there. So yeah, but, but it's the still photograph, good. The, the work is still good. good. Don't, then, don't, don't do that. Yeah. Your work. Uh -huh. <laughs> don't do it, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. So everyone can visit the website. They get access to prints. The books, the one that we just mentioned in, in, in the intro, some information regarding new photo tours that Jan Johan is, is working on and see his magnificent work. You can also get to see his TED Talk for those that don't speak French. Translation at TED Talks is always there for most of the languages. And uh, we'd like to thank you once again for coming to our podcast We enjoy this very, very much. It's, I'm very honored to have you here. Yeah, we both are. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank And, you, guys. Uh, we hope everything went great with the next year. Let's hope this situation improves a lot for us to travel more and to take more photos around the world and create some NFTs. Who knows? Yeah. Ah, yes. <laughs> Th thank you thank you so much for having me I, I will just add something if you guys go on my website for any reason I would strongly suggest uh, that you subscribe to my newsletter that's probably today the best the best way okay. to just yeah. keep being updated more so, information yeah, yeah. Uh, the newsletter is the place to be so anything that would happen for the tour new book new NFT new print whatever uh, the, the subscribers of the newsletter will always know first so it's probably it's probably best to subscribe to the newsletter Yeah, that's you guys right. Go visit right now. <laughs> subscribe, oh, subscribe the newsletter right now. <laughs> But well, not, not, not right now. Only after, after, after yes. listening yeah, to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, once again, Johan, thank you so much yeah, for your thank time. Thank you so much. And for your presentation. Thank you. In Exodus, oh. it was great and quite inspiring yeah. too. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. It was a huge pleasure to be here with you in this podcast, and uh, I wish you all the best for the for the future and for your next your next episodes. Really yeah. looking forward to it. Thank you so Thanks. much. We just give a, a one last word in Portuguese for our listeners. Okay? Don't okay, go away. Perfect. Yes. Malta, espero que tenham gostado deste episódio. Uh, esperemos também que no futuro consigamos aqui ainda ter mais alguns convidados do Exus. Quem sabe? Vamos ver. Se será surpresa ou não? Quem sabe? Um, quem sabe? Quem sabe? Uh, mais uma vez. Muito obrigado por estarem desse lado. Se nos quiserem contactar, já sabem, através do Instagram, por e-mail, que é, Ruben? E o prova de contacto.podcast.com Exatamente. Também estamos presentes no YouTube e nas várias plataformas 
digitais de áudio onde podem ouvir este podcast mais uma vez, muito obrigado por estarem desse lado Só obrigado. O já está quase a acabar mas não somos capazes de ter aí uma outra surpresa na manga, tipo uma prendinha de Natal <risos> vamos, pensar, aguardar, vamos, pensar, aguardar. vamos aguardar um, e espero que estejam bem com vocês e que seja um final de ano bastante bom e que para isto esteja tudo melhor stay safe com os outros Malta, muito obrigado por estarem desse lado um grande abraço